Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We ask that you inspire our hearts. And in this time and seasons, impact us with wisdom. Steer our spirit. That dimension of wisdom, counsel, might, we begin to experience it in the mighty name of Jesus. We receive instructions with which we are functioning in this world. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a three-part series. The first one is the mistakes believers should avoid um, in economic recession or famine or economic hardship. Mistakes believers should avoid in economic hardship or recession or in famine. Bible often refer to it as famine. And so when we say economic recession or hardship or famine, what does it mean? Is either a region or a part of the country or the, the masses couldn't really assess adequate food supply uh, where there is malnutrition, no accessibility to things that helps humankind to survive. Let me just read something that I noted here. This is when people have, are unable to assess adequate food, resulting in widespread acute malnutrition or loss of life due to starvation and disease. Um, so, but I want us to look at it. I mean, economic recession, um, economic hardship, challenges here and there. This is not the first time. It has happened in Bible days. There are close to about 13 famine experiences in the scripture. And they're just going through and, you know, I'm, I'm able to see the mistakes some people made or some people got things right. But I believe believers should have a better understanding in these times and seasons. And I believe God is granting us that grace just like the sons of Issachar that have understanding of times and seasons. Now, I must let you know that God promotes his people during famine, during economic hardship or recession. God always promotes his own people. God will always preserve, promote, protect his own people. Don't forget in Goshen, God separated Israelites from the rest of Egypt. And all throughout the scriptures, you always see God preserving protecting, providing for, all right, his people. And so I want you to first have this, you know, as an assurance in your heart that you are not alone in the economic recession. The economy of the country might be bad, might be difficult, might be hard or harsh now, but God can always sort you and your loved ones out. As a matter of fact, God can use you to be a blessing to the rest of the country or to the rest of your community. When God lifts you, he uses you to preserve and to bless the others. All right? And so these are the reasons why I am putting this out there so that you would not make the same mistakes that some people probably made and will be able to apply our heart to wisdom. Let me start with this scripture, Psalm 37, verse 19. Psalm 37, verse 19 says, They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. So God is saying they will be satisfied in the days of famine. I want to give other versions, NLT, NIV. I want us to see that evil time. He said they will not be disgraced in hard times. Now, these are hard times. So the scripture says, those who trust in God, those who believe in God, will not be disgraced in hard times. You see that? Even in family, they will have more than enough. Can you see that? So I trust that God already has planned for us to have more than enough during family, during economic recession or economic hardship. And none of us will be disgraced. Okay? And he says we'll have more than enough. I have more than enough in the name of Jesus. So you must trust God. You must believe God for you to have more than enough. And it doesn't end there. God is going to communicate to you. God is going to lead you. That is going to be in part two of this. Okay? Now, NIV. NIV says, in times of disaster, they will not wither. 
in days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. Can you see that? When there is no access to adequate supply of food, when there is no access to clean potable water, when the currency seems to be uh, devalued and it looks like you are receiving income and the income is nothing to really write home about, and the cost of living is so high, you see, compared to your income, all right? There are certain mistakes that you must not make. And let me start by saying, number one, you must not doubt and speak unbelief, especially against the prophetic words meant to resolve the economic hardship. And everything I'm sharing with you, I'm, I pick them from the scripture. You must not doubt God. You must not doubt the plan and the prophetic word that you have received from the Lord or that has been proclaimed. Don't forget at the beginning of the year, I also mentioned it. I've heard from different quarters that things will be tough. I also mentioned it, that the first six months this year, might be tough. You have to be very, very wise in the way you go about things. The first six months, seven months thereabout, will be a period of hard time. You have to be very wise. And then thereafter, things will be softening up, things will be better. All right? So then I heard from other quarters too, even from some senior ministers who also confirm it. So the word has already gone out. And God, for us, told us that it's going to be a season of harvest, season of rain and harvest, as if he knew what was going to be happening, and he gave us that word. Okay? According to um, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a seer of flour will sell for a shekel, and two seers of, of barley for a shekel, at the gate of Samaria. There was intense famine. If you check 2 Kings chapter 6, the latter part, you know, the Bible is not in chapters, just written as a book. So if you check that latter part, it talks about how the famine was so intense that the king saw two women and the woman was complaining against the other that they agreed to eat her own child and after eating her child and then that the following time or the following week they will eat the other woman's child. But the other woman eat her child. All right? So it was so intense, the family was so bad that people were eating their children. All right? So the man of God came up with a word. So we have a word over our life. We are not people without a prophetic word. Believers have prophetic words over their life. And those words must not be doubted. Those words must not be disbelieved. Look at a situation in 2 Kings chapter 7. If you go to verse 2, look at it. It said, The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heaven, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat of it. So you can see this man doubted the prophetic word. So one of the mistakes a believer can make now is to doubt the word that God has told you or to doubt the prophetic word. And not just to doubt, if you doubt in your heart and you do not voice it with your mouth, it has no nemesis. It might not have that, you know, so much of implication. It, it still has, but it might not have so much of implication. But when you voice it out, you see, the man of God stood in. He said, you will see it with your own eyes. You see that? He said, but you will not hit any of it. Second Kings chapter 7, verse 16. He said, then the people went out and plundered the camp of Arimans. So a seer of flour sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. Glory to God. It will always happen. Don't forget, the prophet said by this time tomorrow, even put times on it, it will always happen. That means it's 24 hours. All right? I believe 
that some people are here in 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, as the case may be. Your life is turning around in the name of Jesus. He said, as the Lord has said, as the Lord said it, will he not do it? It is not, he is not a man that he should lie. That's what the scripture says. Bible says, by two immutable things, which is impossible for God to lie, once it is confirmed that it is said by God, then you must believe it and have faith. It's a mistake on our part as believers if you do not believe what God has told you, not just even to the collective. You must believe what God has said collectively to the collective, and you must also believe what God has told you personally. Now look at the next verse. The consequence came for people who doubt the prophetic. Now the king had put the officer on whose arm the lay, on whose arm he laid in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died, just as the man of God had foretold when the king came down to his house. Can you see that? When the king came down to his house, the man died. Don't forget, verse 16 says, just as the Lord has said, the economy changed. Verse um, 17 says, just as the man of God has said. It wasn't even God that said it. It was the man of God that said it. And so you must know that that is the first mistake anybody can make. First mistake anybody can make. All right? Now, second mistake is making a foolish economic-based decision or agreement. You must not make a foolish economic-based decision or agreement. It's quite important that you must not make a foolish economic-based decision or agreement. Second Kings chapter 6. People make foolish decisions. Um, that you're a believer doesn't mean you can't make foolish decisions. You must just apply your heart to wisdom in order to make accurate, smart, and wise decisions. All right? Um, it's not a time to throw unnecessary party to do ceremony. Let me say, when one of the decisions you can make that is foolish is to throw, to be so ceremonial and spend money lavishly. Do you understand? Spend money lavishly. To waste food, you drink, and half of it you waste it. You eat, you know, some part of it you waste it. If you don't, if you have much more than enough, that habit is detested by God. It's detested. Because after Jesus did a miracle of, you know, multiplying bread, if you remember, there were two 12 baskets remaining. He told them to gather all the fragments, gather everything. 12 baskets. Jesus was not wasteful. And he doesn't want us to be wasteful. So it means that as tiny as the grain of rice could be, you have to ensure that it's not a bad decision to waste food, waste water, waste drink, waste things. So you have to be careful. You must be careful of waste. You must be careful to not make foolish decisions. Another foolish decision people make, apart from throwing lavish party, some people will argue that if you have the money, throw it. But I'm telling you, in economic difficulty, it is not a wise decision. It is not a wise. We can't tell you how to spend your money. We can only advise and counsel you. That is it. Because the purpose of prosperity is for you to be comfortable, is for others to be blessed, and is for God to be glorified. The kingdom to try. Be careful the kind of businesses you invest in. If you don't have full information, you cannot invest in those businesses. If you don't have accurate, necessary information, because it can amount to wastefulness. You can waste that resources, and there is need for you to be careful how you invest. Now, I want to read a scripture in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 25. It says, and there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cup of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Thank God for um, our own economic um, challenges that we are having. You know, um, I think a bag of rice was, for, was sold for like 35,000 before or 40,000. And then 
um, I heard it's now like 70 something thousand. But in this particular situation, it's like maybe times 10 or times whatever. Okay? All right, so it was so difficult. But you understand what I mean now when we go. He said, then as the king of Israel was passing by on the world, a woman cried unto, out to him, saying, help my lord, O king. Verse 27, and he said, if the lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Uh, so this king himself is hopeless. There's no, it was so serious. Then the king said to her, what is troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, so that means another woman spoke to her, look at it, uh, to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. Yes, look at that agreement now. You can have such agreement with people and it can be so foolish of you. So we bought my son and had him and I said to her, on the next day, give your son that we may eat him, but she has eaten her son. So in a period of economic recession, difficulties, hardship, people make stupid decisions. Before you agree to eat, that somebody should eat your own son, you should have put our own son or the other people's resources in a cage where you'll be able to have access to it. All right? Know that um, their own is free and they eat your own. So it's a, it was a bad decision. So there are times that people make bad economic decisions, okay? So that's very important. That's very important. And one of the ways to make a good decision is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Number three. Now, this is number three is very important. You have to listen to me very well. Believing religiously, I say believing religiously and acting foolishly to sow seeds only without saving or investing. And saving or investing without sowing seeds. Now, we, don't, we all know what it means to sow seed. Around the time of resection, economic hardship, God always demands that we are faithful in what we give to him. It's not just about tithing. It's beyond that. God takes care of the rest when you make him a priority. You have heard many teachings about that. You know how you are supposed to honor God with your offering and honor him. You are not doing a transactional um, um, deal with God that I give you this and you multiply back to me. No, that's not what you are honoring him with your offering, honoring him with your tithe, 100%, 10%, 20% as the case may be, honoring him with your partnership. But you see, you don't just do that. It's foolish of it to be very foolish of you if all that you are doing is sowing seed to God and you see, you are not saving. In the scripture, scripture taught us about saving. Now, if you check the Joseph economic model, in the year of plenty, Joseph told them to save 20% because there was going to be another family. So saving and investing matters. In fact, when I'm doing the part three or part two of this series, I will tell you one of the most important commodity to have or to secure that can be like, just like bank invest in gold or financial institutions have gold as backup, countries have gold as backup, Land can be a backup because people have to trade their land for survival during economic crisis. But we'll get to that. So this is quite important that you don't sow and not save. And you don't save and invest and not sow. You give to honor God and God gives you a wisdom uh, to really know where and what to invest in and um, saving. Do you get what I'm saying? The wisdom to know in which currency to save, uh, whether you used to buy a digital currency or whichever, God gives you wisdom. And that is why when you are sowing, so to honor him so that you can tap wisdom from him. What he gives you is idea, concept, wisdom. It's not doubling money back to you. All right? But whatever God breathes, when God breathes on you, you know, he gives you things that will eventually generate uh, money. There's nothing wrong with sowing, don't get me wrong. During economic crisis, when Elijah said, by my word in 1 King chapter 17, um, when Elijah said, by my word, there shall not be rain, there was immediately famine. And I want you to know, God withhold him rain, withhold him blessing, is what causes famine on the earth. There are famine that's economic recession or economic acid that are product of 
um, human miscalculations and all that. But there are some other famine that is like a direct uh, punishment from God for people to be conscious uh, that God is supreme. I mean, there are two basic fundamental things to survival or to thriving on the earth. You must recognize God as being a sovereign a ruler over everything. And then you must also be conscious of your own personal responsibility in the scheme of things as a kingdom person. So you see, Elijah was led to go into the brook. So he was fed by ravens and he was taking water from the brook. And then when the brook dried up, the farming was so serious that the brook dried up. And he had to be led again to a woman, you know, referred to in the scripture as widow of Zarephath. Jesus even referred to it. That there were many widows, but Elijah was sent to widow of Zarephath specifically. So it means that God leads you specifically. I'm still going to talk about that. And then what did Elijah do with the woman? The woman had her last meal to eat, herself and her son, and they should die. But Elijah said, first do my own, then yours will be taken care of. And she did. She sold into the life of Elijah, and then the woman lived in abundance throughout the time of that famine. You see that? So sowing is important, but at the same time, if you look at Joseph's economic model, saving and investment is important. This is the time you must be thinking of what multiple, you know, um, streams of income. Um, things that can multiply um, the resources that you have. And don't just save, because saving, you can be, your money can be getting devalued. You must tap wisdom to know the best things to do. Number four, refusing to align with prophetic instructions uh, or obeying God's voice directing you to act and do certain things. Around this period, like I told you initially, God always preserve, protect, provide, all right? Defend his own people. It's like darkness just looms over everywhere and there's obscurity, uncertainty in terms of economy and God will always sort his own people out. So that is why you must be seeking the light, insight around this time. So there are instructions that God is giving to you which you must take and obey. So, but when you refuse to align with the prophetic instructions, these prophetic instructions sometimes come for the collective. Maybe you are part of a gathering, if you are part of communion now, there are prophetic instructions that might be collective. And there are direct personal one-on-one -on -one instructions that God is giving you. You must not, you know, reject them. Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. My people become poorer in economic recession, and my provision for them is to be richer, to be blessed, to be comfortable, but they become poorer for lack of knowledge. And if you check that scripture, O.C. chapter uh, 4, verse 6, I think, if you check that scripture very well, it says, because they have rejected knowledge, I also reject them. So don't reject God's prophetic instructions. Refusing to, if you don't accept the prophetic instruction and align yourself to obey God's voice, directing you to act or to do certain things, it will be difficult. All right? It will be a very great mistake. Let me give you an example. There is a prophetic instruction in the scripture that God told Isaac not to leave Gerah in, in Genesis chapter 26 when there was famine. God told him not to leave Gerah, not to leave his own city where he was at the time. And he stayed in the land. Bible says he labored, he planted, he walked, he sowed, and he reaped. That word sowed there means he labored. He planted crops. He walked um, livestock. And Bible says he became very successful. He became the envy of the Philistines. But there are other scriptures where God, if you check 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 to 37, there is a Shunammite woman that was ministering to Elisha. 2 Kings chapter 4, Verse 8, to, that took care of Elisha and all that. Elisha gave her a prophetic warning that there's going to be a famine that will last for many years. I think it lasted for like seven years. And Elisha told the woman to relocate from that particular place, from Israel. And the woman relocated 
so that she could avoid that period of famine. So in, in some cases, God telling you to relocate, there's no problem with it. There are people God will tell to wait. There are people God will tell to relocate. Do you understand? So the key thing is, when God speaks to you, just align and do whatever he tells you to do. All right? Look at it. When God spoke in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1, through Elisha. Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord and all that, and by this time tomorrow and all that. You know, the people who heard it, they were not the ones that moved with that prophecy. Sometimes God will want his words to come to pass regardless whether you are obedient to it or not. And that is why most of the time people will hear it because they are already familiar with the system, familiar with the person that speaks God's word, familiar and then they have unbelief or doubt in their hearts. It's amazing how people gather with saints and they still have a lot of doubt and unbelief in their hearts. People say amen to what they don't believe. Consciously, they don't believe it. In their subconscious, there are so much hindrances with their logic and they can't relate with it. And this is sensitive because God will not have to move other people who didn't hear the prophecy, who just believe, uh, let's do this business, let's do that. And God will be walking things through unbelievers, walking things through people who don't know anything about prophetic word, who don't know anything about. Whereas the children of the kingdom themselves disregarded the prophetic word that God gave because probably because of familiarity, offenses or whatever, unbelief and doubt in their heart. And God had to go outside to go and locate people who, are, who will be already host to those ideas and concepts that can revolutionize this. Look at how God just chose four lepers who just said, why sit we here till we die? That means common businessmen can be thinking of, oh, what do we do now that the economy is like this? They have nothing to do with God. They don't believe, probably they don't even believe in God. But they are putting their minds to work there and you see prophecy happening through them. So you must learn to Align yourself with prophetic instructions and obey God's directives. That is very important. Refusing to do that is mistake number four. Number five, mistake number five. He's living sorrowfully and complaining about economic hardship. There's already hardship in town. Don't make it worse for yourself and your family. Number one, you must live. The kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but it's in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You live in the kingdom. You must be conscious of the economy of the kingdom of God. You must be conscious that you are more or less living in the embassy of heaven on the earth. So you are being taken care of by God, by heaven, by the heavenly resources. You are more or less like an envoy of heaven, of God on the earth. So if a nation's economy is becoming so difficult and hard, then you can always connect to the government connect to the kingdom in which you are a bona fide citizen. So don't make that mistake because once you are not conscious that you are a kingdom person in this economy, not just a Nigerian, but a kingdom person, you know, a child of God that already has all the provisions that he needs on the earth, blessed with all spiritual blessings. If you are not conscious of that, you'll be almost, you'll, you'll be getting demoralized, you know, getting depressed, and you'll be conscious of so many things around you bad news and you don't know when you start saying negative things and that is very very dangerous and that can be a very costly mistake and you'll be living sorrowfully always complaining about things instead of praying i've always said that once you see people complain always they are not the time that really pray all the time and hear god's voice let's look at psalm 105 verse 16. let me show you something psalm 105 verse 16. then we move to job chapter 5 verse 22. he said moreover he called for a famine in the land he destroyed all the provisions of the, of the bread. There is another scripture I want to show you. Job chapter 5 verse 22. Look at it. You shall laugh at destruction and famine, and you shall not be afraid of the beast of the earth. Now you can go ahead and read all the scriptures. Look at it. You shall laugh at the destruction and the famine, and you shall not be afraid of the beast of the earth. The beast, yes, it doesn't have to be lion, it doesn't have to be, it could be devourers, it could be people who manipulate the economy, it could be, you shall not be afraid of wickedness of men. You shall not be afraid of the evils in town. Now, because of time, let me just quickly rush the rest. 
Number six, another mistake you must not make is that God deliberately will raise some kingdom giants, kingdom financiers, kingdom business guru, kingdom from our names. And you must not make mistake of attacking them. You can imagine. Joseph was sold into slavery, sold into, he was put in the pits, then to Potiphar's house, then from there to prison, and then became prime minister. And when they came, his brothers came because of farming to Egypt, and Joseph met with them, they reconciled, he, they were afraid of Joseph, he told them, he said, God has sent me ahead of you. Joseph said, God has sent me ahead of you in order to preserve you. So when God is raising people among us, they are breaking through in business. It's not, those kind of people are not people you envy. You shouldn't even have envy at all. At the same time, you don't envy, you don't attack those kind of people. Somebody bought a new car, you rejoice with them. Somebody is starting a new business, somebody is making it big, you rejoice with them. The reason is because those people are signs that God, are, God is operating in your neighborhood and it, should, it will soon be your turn. All right? Once you rejoice with them, then you're already enlisting yourself for your own personal miracles and for your own blessings. And the kingdom financiers or people that God raised, let me just refer to it as people who are blessed, that God blessed in the kingdom, should also know that this thing is not just for their personal comfortability alone, and it's not just for kingdom advancement alone, it's also for you to be a blessing to people. Just today, I still wired some money to one or two persons who was in financial difficulty. All right? And now, I am also believing God for massive financial breakthrough in my own personal life. But you see, as you grow up, you must also help lift other people up. And that is the life we have been called to do. So you don't customize the blessings of God. They are for you. They are, be, they are for people also, you know, to be blessed. They are things that have been targeted to you for you to manage and distribute. So you must take note of that. If you are the one being lifted, and if you are the type that have people around you being lifted, you don't attack them. If they saw Joseph as the prime minister of Egypt, and his brothers were still attacking him, that means they are sons of perdition. And that is what some people do. They carry stones and start throwing stones at people that are lifted you know, from among them. So you must not make that mistake and start attacking people. Why is this one uh, flying private jet? Why is this one in this economic condition? Every little you are complaining and you are attacking people. You are using words as stones to attack people. You must not make that mistake. And the last one is you must not allow discouragement at this time that things are, you know, economically hard and it looks like things are difficult. You must, you know, one of the things God told Joshua is that Moses is dead. It might look like you are in a state of hopelessness now. All right? Income might not be coming in as you expect. Your money, the one you have in bank, is already probably permitted and then devalued. And um, it looks like things are, not fought, it, things are not happening the way you expect. Just like Moses is dead, and Joshua was like, hey, what's happening now? And God said, arise and lead people into the uh, Canaan land and distribute the inheritance for them. Now, this is very important. You must take note. The only message God gave Joshua is be strong and courageous. So tough times should make us tougher. And you know tough times don't last, but tough people will always outlast tough times. So you will be tougher in prayers, tougher praising the Lord, must not be discouraged to continue to sow the seeds. When I say sow the seeds, now it's not just in giving. You are speaking the right words. And you are working with your hands and with your brain. You must not be discouraged to plan, to perform, to implement, to execute, to always showing up. You must put away garment of depression, all kinds of sorrow, all kinds of money, pity party. You must wake up. Tough times always demand toughness. You must be tough as a person. If there is a time that you need to give a proper attention to your business and career, this is the time. You must wake up and not be discouraged. So if you check Joshua chapter 1, if you read from verse 1 to 9, about three or four times, God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. And that reminds me what Daniel wrote. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 32b, he says, those who do know their God and strong shall do exploits. So we need to be courageous at this time 
And please, you have to encourage yourself. I remember David, their wives were taken captive. Their properties, his men, their wives were taken. And they came back, you know, to Ziglag. And then they've carried all their things. They wept, wept, wept. I think it's First Samuel chapter 30. And Bible says his, his mighty men thought of stoning him because of the decisions they made. And then they were all depressed. He himself was depressed. But Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. And he prayed, should I pursue these people? And God said, pursue, you overtake them, and you will catch them. And then they did, and God helped them. They recover everything, and they still had SS loot and spoils of invading those people. So that's when things look so hopeless. That's when God shows up, and then you now have gains and profit in addition. I'm sure this has been very fantastic, and I want you to be on the lookout for the next part of this series because we have to be deliberate in these economic difficulties that the nation is going through. I'm sure you have been blessed. God bless you. You can send me your questions if you have questions and I will treat them. God bless you.